Uh, so Leo's asking, Oliver, what's the uh, secret to entering into the first bar of the day? I monitor the first two minute period of the market day very closely. That is a very important key to my rapid ability to grab gains quickly by properly reading that first two minute period. So um, Salil is asking, Oliver, what's the secret to entering into the first bar of the day before even the two minute period is finished? I never managed to get that right, he says. What are the scenarios? Well, the key scenarios to getting this right is what I'm looking for in that first two minute period is I'm looking for power and velocity. A two minute bar can grow, but there are different types of growth. It can grow in a, it can grow although it's struggling to grow. It can grow with power, umph, and certainty. And it can grow kind of gradual and smooth. I want that power. I want that punch. I want that I'm raring and roaring to go bar. Let's go. Let's get this done. All right. That's the type of two minute bar I'm looking for now. So it's velocity and power of the bar, how the bar is being formed. In addition to that, I'm looking for that power and abruptness, that unmistakable oomph. I'm looking for that to originate from a ver from several very unique positions. So it becomes power and position, the two P's. I want power in the right position, okay? And when I can link those two, when I have power that is originating from a right position, as an example, power that's originating off of a flat 200 period moving average. Wow, I'm, you know what I'm saying? So that's a scenario of, excuse me, power and umph originating from a nice position, go. The two Ps, that's your key. Is there a special, is there a special setup or screener uh, one, one D to determine potential boom stocks for the next day's open? Do I, ha do I use screeners to find my plays? No. Um, I don't. And I'm not flipping for my plays either, like, a, like you see a lot of traders do, and flipping through a, a long list of stocks. I teach my traders that their, their stock watch list, their daily trading list should be no more than 10 symbols. It should be no, long, no less than 6 and no more than 10. The professional is not, uh, I look at the whole market. Professionals don't trade that way. Professionals trade things that they trade virtually every single day. They trade things that they are absolutely intimate with, familiar with. They trade things that they know like the back of their hand. They don't, tr they don't just search for where the opportunity is. The same way a New York Stock Exchange specialist is in the pit and trades one thing. Just because he hears some noise at another pit, he doesn't leave his pit and go over there and trade. He trades his one thing. This is what he knows. This is his life. This is his bread and butter. This is his, his baby. This is his child. This is more of a professional approach than where's the news? Where's the action? Um, can I scan for what's in motion? That is more of a novice approach to the market. Professional traders understand that the action always comes to their stocks. Every stock gets its day. Every stock gets its momentum. Every stock gets its breakout. Every stock gets its uptrend. Every stock gets its downtrend. Every stock gets its momentum, its power, its moves, its excitement, its earnings, its gaps. Every stock gets it. So what you should do instead of being a searcher is you should sit back, stand still, and be a waiter. The searchers are on the novice side of the game. The waiters are the professional side of the game. Uh, boss, could you tell us the story of how I discovered the Fantastic Four? Sounds like a great concept to me. Thank you. Um, I didn't discover it. I came up with it. All right. So I came up with this concept called the, the Fabulous Four. It's the four most important things at the open of every day. And I was trying to find a way to get my traders to be able to understand off the open where is your ceiling and where is your floor? 
sometimes you don't have a ceiling or a floor. Sometimes you don't have a ceiling, but you have a floor. And sometimes you have a floor, but you don't have a ceiling. But there is one of them every morning. And so you can't start your trading day unless you know, does my stock off the open have a ceiling or does it have a floor? It can't. In some cases, it can have both, but we don't want those. We only we want to we want to take our list of 10 and drill right down to which ones have a floor but don't have a ceiling and also which ones have a ceiling but don't have a floor. OK. And so once you can get to that, then you say, OK, I've got three stocks that have a ceiling and two stocks that have a floor. OK. Then you take those five and you say, but which ones that have a ceiling are closest to the ceiling? And which ones that have a floor are right above the floor? Now you right now you maybe that's three of them. So you've taken five down to three. Now, these are the three you, you trade off the open. But you only trade them if they give you that first bar of velocity, of power, of oomph because you've got them originating from either a floor or dropping from a ceiling or moving up from a floor with velocity, boom. And so traders that have a hard time, they don't know how to get down to the creme de la creme. And this is an important skill, traders. You have to know how to get down. How do you, you can't trade 10 stocks at the same time. You've got to be able to know which ones have the highest probability of moving with the highest velocity, the fastest off the open. What's my fastest? What's the fast, fastest horse in the game today? Coming from the right position. And so I came up with this neat little method called the fabulous four. Guys, you can look at I'm not going to go over that today. You can that I, I have videos on that on the channel. All right. Talking about the Fantastic Four or the Fabulous Four. I call it both things um, where if I get my traders focused on identifying the four most important things off the open, those four things make up this zone that is either a ceiling or a floor. And so I make them practice, grab the four things. Now. Take the four things and make a box around it. That box is either the floor or the ceiling. Now let's look for things near the floor and let's look for things near the ceiling, near their ceiling. All right. If the stock has a ceiling, is it near the ceiling? If the stock has a floor, is it near the floor? I want stocks dropping from their ceiling and I want them going up from their floor. Does that make sense? All right. These things, guys, are not in books. They're not in articles. They're not in Facebook chat rooms. You understand? This is 38 years of professional trading experience talking to you. How do you how do I choose stocks, a stock watch list? I actually went over this today. I'll give you some brief, brief clues as to how to grab a, a watch list. Right? I was teaching my traders today and that you want price representation. So you never want, let's say you're going to build a 10 stock trading list, watch list. You don't want all 10 stocks clustered in the same price range. So you want price diversification, price representation, but you have to pick a price range. So let's say the price range is $30 to 120. Okay. That's your range 30 to 120. So if you have a range, the majority of your range should be the majority of the stocks should sit in the middle of that range. And then you should have some stocks sprinkled on the outer ends of that range. So the majority should be around $70, 70, 80, 60, 70, 80, like that. That's where the majority should be. Then you should have one or two above and one or two below, right? That's number one, price diversification. Number two, you want you want sector diversification. So you might want, you know, you might want a bank stock in there, a banker, a one or two bank stocks, one or two chip stocks, one or two oil stocks, 
one or two metals, um, one or two big tech stocks, one or two socials, one or two uh, transportation stocks, whatever. You want at least four sectors represented in the list. You don't want a stock, a list of 10 stocks and eight of them are bank stocks. That's ridiculous. OK, so you want price representation. You want sector representation. Then you want volatility. So listen, most people are afraid of volatility. Like everyone says, Oliver, Bitcoin's volatile. Exactly. That's where the opportunity is. We as we as marketplace, I want volatility. I can turn volatility into my friend. It's an enemy when you have no knowledge. It's an enemy. Volatility is an enemy when you're not skilled, when you have no knowledge, when you're not educated, when you don't know how to turn volatility in your, into your friend. I want volatility. So you want price rep representation, sector representation, and volatility. You don't want a dead stock. You don't want a stock where every time you get into it, it's like watching paint dry, you know, or watching the grass grow. Like you don't need that. Time is of the essence when you're trading, because if you're hanging in your trades too long, there's opportunity cost. There's other things popping off that you're missing. All right. And so you need volatility. And the way to do that is by average true range. Pick stocks that have a very decent average true range for their specific price range. And that's how you narrow things down. So once you get your sectors in place and you're in, in the right price range, so you've got your drug stocks, you've got your banks, you've got your chip stocks, you've got your big tech stocks. Now you've got maybe a list of 20, 30. Now you've got to get those down based on the criteria of volatility. Maybe you have nine banks, but you've got to get down to two. Which two have the highest volatility? All right. Maybe you have four chip stocks, but you need to get down to one. Which one has the highest volatility? And that's how you come up with that six to ten. Boom. You sit there. You don't watch anything else. You don't look at anything else. You don't trade anything else for many, 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 many months. And then after that period, you do research on this list. OK. What's my best performing symbol? What's my worst performing symbol? Which symbol delivers the biggest gains? Which symbol do I tend to, to, to have the biggest, most debilitating losses in? Which symbol is the most boring? Which one's the most active? You start to do, and maybe you'll replace one or two. And over time, this process gets you to a core six to ten, that you don't change for years sometimes. I traded Apple every day of my life for 18 years. It's only recently that I stopped trading it every day because its nature has changed a bit. 18 years every single day of my life. That's a professional. Oliver, how to know if pullbacks after, how to know if pullbacks after elephant bars are viable? So let's say, for instance, you're getting this power bar surge off the 200. And typically any and let's say it starts pulling back from here. Now, typically you want it to hold the halfway mark. That is your healthiest. OK, that is your healthiest when it holds the halfway mark. When you start to break down this halfway mark, if you lose about 80% of it, you have, to, you have to assume that this bar has failed, all right? And certainly, if the entire bar has been taken away by the drop, it's over. But the 80% of it is enough, actually, all right? And so, um the best the best scenarios hold the 50 percent but that's in anything guys that's in anything so you see this run up here you see this pullback now this is the halfway mark this held the top right if it broke down here 
it's likely to do something like that. So as you can see, when you finally, it's the move after every pause. So there's a pause and then there's the next move. Now here's the halfway mark of that. When you break that halfway mark, it's over from there. Now, if you look at the move all the way down, check this out, watch this. You've got this move from here. So we drop and then we go here. We don't violate the halfway mark there. We drop here. Let me show you this. So we drop from here to there. Now, what's the halfway mark? About right there. We bounce up to the halfway mark and drop. Now, let's take the halfway mark here. We bounce up to the halfway mark and we drop. Now, let's take the halfway mark here. We bounce up to the halfway mark and we drop. Do you see? Now, let's take this. You see this drop? Now, where's the halfway mark there? But this breaks it. So now, that's your potential bottom. See? The first time the halfway mark was broken, we haven't really seen any significant lower pricing. And so, this is the case in multiple bar runs. It's also the case in a single bar run where you cut that in half. And if your stock starts pulling back on you, you want that to hold the top half. All right, I hope that helps.